I'm really grateful uh, to be with you all tonight. In particular, opportunities I have to partner with Christian Union are always a special blessing. I think partly because I can see my skeptical self in the audience when I speak on uh, Ivy League campuses. In particular, I came to Christ as a freshman uh, at Princeton and, and journeyed through that a whole year, really wrestling through the scriptures and wrestling uh, with my questions. And actually, just about two weeks ago, uh, my colleague Abdu Murray and I uh, spoke for Christian Union. It, it was through the Yale uh, chapter, but they opened it up to the entire Ivy League and to Stanford. And so we had this digital event um, with agnostics and atheists from across all of those different campuses. And uh, people gave their lives to Christ. Uh, we've heard some fantastic testimonials uh, since then. Uh, there's one um, atheist who I'm in contact with. He came with a very antagonistic, angry question initially, but but I hope that I met him with gentleness and respect. And that sort of, I think, opened up the floor to everyone to think, oh, wow, I really can ask a hard question and it's going to be received well. It's going to be received as a gift and not in a, in a defensive way. And we just had a phenomenal time uh, discussing in a smaller breakout room towards the end of the event. And that student, uh, I asked him if he would correspond with me. I had an email in my inbox by the next morning. Uh, uh, and now we're going back and forth. And he said to me, I, I was surprised by the emotion that came out when I asked my question. And so we're digging into that, where that emotion uh, might be coming from. I think a lot of us uh, are finding in this season of pandemic that there's an emotion uh, that we didn't realize was so uh, just below the surface uh, and is revealing things about uh, what we believe and what we hold dear and what we're concerned about and what we're anxious about. So it's, it's an exciting time for the gospel, even as we um, travel through really difficult times as well. I have a neat connection with Christian Union as well, because when I first arrived at Princeton, uh, Christian Union's founder, Matt Bennett, was actually ministering with crew. Uh, and so he was the crew leader, the staff leader at Princeton. And so he oversaw the ministry that I actually came to Christ uh, through. Uh, and I like to think that I had something to do with the founding of Christian Union. I think Matt thought, you know, when he came across me, he thought, oh, you know what, we're going to need a different model. We're, we're going to need a different model to, to, to reach someone, someone like Vince. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, the work of Christian Union across the campuses of the Ivy League and beyond is very um, exciting to me. Uh, in particular, the way that uh, there's a coupling of a seriousness about the life of the mind and of clearing away intellectual objections, but also uh, a, a real steadfastness and understanding faith as something which is relational between yourself and Jesus and an invitation that someone needs to respond to in a manner of relational trust. And I think when you put those two things together and you're speaking to students' minds as well as to their hearts at the same time, uh, there's something very powerful that takes place. And I saw that myself when, when I was initially coming to faith and then as a student ministering alongside Matt at Princeton as well in the late 90s and the early 2000s when we saw a real Christian renewal um, on that campus and something we continue to, to pray for. I can think of at least five generations of students um, sharing Christ with other students who then gave their life to Christ from the people who led the guy who led me to Christ to myself, to people that I led to Christ, to people that they led to Christ. It's really exciting to be able to look back on that time. And I think we see that work being carried on um, by Christian Union as well. I'm excited to speak tonight uh, about sort of the intersection of work and relationships um, and the gospel. Um, uh, despite the lengthy bio that you heard, one of the things you did not hear in that in that bio is a, a vast amount of experience working in secular contexts. Uh, the, the pinnacle of my business career uh, came as an intern at the age of 16 on the floor of the New York uh, Stock Exchange. Uh, I think I did not make enough money to cover all the food that I ate, uh, bacon, egg, and cheese every morning when I got off the path train and, and walked to work and about four dirty water dogs in Jersey City on, on the way home. That was about as much as I got paid for that, uh, for that internship. But So I don't really come from that perspective, and I'm excited for the Q&A because I think some of you will be able to bring uh, a perspective and an experience in terms of your actual work life. But I do do a lot of my ministry in secular context, yes, academic context, uh, but also business context as well. And I think a lot about what the relationship is between work and the gospel. And I think this is where we're spending, for many of us, more than half of our waking hours. Well, what does it look like to be gospel-focused, ministry-centered in the context uh, of that? So 
I, I'm going to share some thoughts in, in in that direction, and and maybe just to start off, let, let me read you. Uh, this is an article. It was originally published in the New York Times, I think, in 2014. I came across it recently. Uh, so there was an editor's note at the beginning. It said, "We hope you're not total totally miserable at the office tomorrow, but if you are, here's one article that may explain why." Then the article began with these words. It says, "The way we're working." isn't working. Even if you're lucky enough to have a job, very relevant right now, you're probably not very excited to get to the office in the morning. You don't feel much appreciated while you're there. You find it difficult to get your most important work accomplished amid all the distractions, and you don't believe that what you're doing makes much of a difference anyway. By the time you get home, you're pretty much running on empty and yet still answering emails until you fall asleep. This experience is common not just to middle managers, but also to top executives. And then a bit further down, the article goes on and it says, for most of us, in short, work is a depleting, dispiriting experience. And in some obvious ways, it's getting worse. Now, hopefully, uh, you or your employees are uh, not the ones who were interviewed for that article. But unfortunately, I think this does characterize many people's experience of work. And actually, I mean, even the etymology of the word business, right, traces to an old English word that has the sense of anxiety. And I think that's true of many people's experience of work. It's primarily an endeavor that produces anxiety and stress and burden in one's life. It's a necessary evil. At best, we can strive for a work-life balance which when you think about that phrase actually already concedes that work is not going to be life-giving. That's why we need a work-life balance. And then if we're lucky, one day we'll retire and never have to work again. Retire, another interesting word, French roots meaning to retreat from battle or to remove from active service. And it, it makes me reflect, you know, as a Christian, is that really my goal? with more than half of my waking hours to eventually get to the point where I can retreat from battle, remove myself from active service. Is that really the best that we can aim for? Now, culturally, I think we're living through a particularly important time for us to re-envision work and work-based relationships. So what I wanna do is first make some remarks about culture generally, and give you a sense of why I think that's the case. And then I'll get more practical in thinking through concretely, what, what could a redemptive corporate culture look like? What could it look like to have a gospel-focused experience of our, of our working life? Uh, for starters, as I, I make a couple of cultural reflections on why I think this is an important time to be asking these questions. The, the pandemic has thrown so much up in the air, obviously, in terms of the way we work. And it's also... I think forcing many people to face some of the deep questions of life in a way that they haven't in a long time. Uh, Google searches for God were at a five-year high in March. Obviously, that's not a coincidence. Uh, I think of the uh, article that was written in the New York Times by the atheist uh, writer Elaine de Botton. He said, basically, the pandemic is not going away. Uh, he said, actually, the pandemic is just reminding us of the reality of the human condition that actually we are always in the plague. He said, we are always in the plague if what we mean by the plague is the susceptibility to sudden death. Life is a hospice, never a hospital. Piercing words from an atheist reflecting on this season through the worldview, really, of Albert Camus. And I think a lot of people, maybe not putting exactly that wording to it, but I think that's an experience that many people are having. Usually we're good at distracting ourselves from our vulnerability to the susceptibility of sudden death. The pandemic is reminding us of that reality, and I don't think that that's going to go away. I find it ironic that uh, we thought we wanted social distancing. When you think about it, as a society, we spent so much time trying to use technological means to socially distance ourselves from one another, so often in the same room, but not talking face to face, just you know, on our phones. Now that social distance has been forced upon us, 
we're realizing that's not at all what we want. And we're using every technological means at our disposal, just as we are tonight, to try to get ourselves back into authentic community. It's also uh, interesting to think about the way so often we think we want to, or at least willingly choose to, wear masks. Uh, think about the mask of social media, for one, right? An environment in which we can put forward only the things that people want us to see, uh, only the things we want other people to see about us, and we can mask so much else. I think in 2020, we're realizing that the telos of the trajectory that we've been on is not at all where we want to end up. And as a result, many people are asking deep questions of life with an earnestness and an urgency that we haven't seen in a long time. So the pandemic is one massive factor to say, let's re-envision how we are spending a very large bulk of our time in the workplace. But even before the pandemic, there's another reason that I think culturally we're living in a key moment to sort of re-envision how the gospel intersects with work and with working relationships. Now, ironically, the reason for my hopefulness in this respect and thinking that this is a key time is actually based in two aspects of culture that I find particularly frustrating. That may seem sort of odd. My hopefulness is based in aspects of culture that I find frustrating, but hopefully it will be become clear as I reflect on this. So two aspects of contemporary culture that oftentimes frustrate me. One, we are offended by everything. Okay? As a society, we are offended by everything. And secondly, we forgive nothing. Okay, first, People are so easily offended. Okay, I recently read that there's a raging debate going on about whether Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is seriously problematic because it depicts Rudolph being bullied, even though Rudolph is ultimately the hero of the story. I also recently saw that uh, millennials are highly offended by the new monopoly for millennials which plays into generational stereotypes. So instead of money, you collect experience points by visiting places such as a vegetarian bistro, a bike share, and your friend's couch. I'm sure we can all come up with our own examples, but we're living in a culture and a society where truly anything can cause offense. And it's very hard not to get caught up in that cycle. If you are offended that people are so offended, well, then you're part of the problem. But if you're not offended that people are so offended, then you're implicitly affirming the culture of offense. There's no way out. It's increasingly difficult to open your mouth on any significant matter without being labeled unsafe. And the temptation, I think, is just to keep your mouth shut, which is actually exactly what Facebook concluded, according to the leak of a policy about a year ago, it was an internal memo that was circulated to Facebook employees about new rules for open and respectful communication at work. And among those rules were, don't try to change someone's politics or religion. The memo continues. These guidelines apply to all work communications, including workplace, email, chat, tasks, posters, whiteboards, chalkboards, and face-to-face. -face. Facebook was challenged on the policy but it defended it, saying that it ensured internal communication would be respectful. Now, the logical implication of that is that trying to change someone's political or religious beliefs is inherently disrespectful. And now as a Christian who's been instructed to go and make disciples of all nations and to follow God rather than human precepts, that creates a big problem for me. Now, the other aspect of culture that I find uh, very frustrating is its unforgiveness. Okay, so often, once offense has occurred, forgiveness is already off the table. When a scandal breaks and a leader falls publicly, if you want a flurry of retweets on Twitter, what's your best bet for a word choice? probably unforgivable. Use that word and it will be lauded. 
It used to be that if someone had done something wrong, the instinctive cry was for confession and repentance. Confess your sins and leniency will be shown. But today, very few people see a problem with saying that something is unforgivable. Jesus, on the contrary, said we must be willing to forgive someone 77 times. I mean, the most remarkable thing about that instruction is that Jesus is envisioning that somebody has actually wronged you 76 times. You have forgiven them 76 times, and yet you are still in enough relationship with them. You're still making yourself vulnerable enough in relationship with them that they are able to wrong you the 77th time in order for you to then offer forgiveness. That's the polar opposite of today's culture, where today it's fine to not forgive, to disassociate ourselves, to cancel someone altogether. Okay, let me take a a step back for a second and summarize. We live in a culture where it's impossible to avoid offending people. And then once you have offended people, forgiveness is not a possibility. Here's why that's so dangerous. I think the health of any relationship or of any community can be measured by the size gap between the offense and the forgiveness in that relationship or that society. Okay, if you don't have that much forgiveness, but you also don't have that much offense, then things might be manageable. Okay, maybe you have a lot of offense, but you also have a lot of forgiveness and reconciliation. Again, you might be able to have health in the context of that relationship or community. But when you have a high level of offense and very little forgiveness, when that gap is that wide, then you're really in a tough spot. And I'm not sure that the societal gap between offense and a lack of forgiveness has ever been as wide as it is right now. And I fear that that gap is only widening. I think social media is one reason for that because social media tends to skyrocket offense and only further constrain forgiveness. A tweet for a tweet is so much less costly than an eye for an eye. On social media, I've been called all sorts of names by people who disagree with what I believe in. The Antichrist, a murderer, rarely would anyone say these things to my face? There would be a cost involved. You have to make yourself vulnerable in front of someone face to face. But it happens pretty regularly on social media. And there's almost no reconciliation for any of it. Because in a social media age, it's typical for interaction to be done at a great distance. And it can be very effective to hurt someone from a distance, to offend someone from a distance. If I yell at you across the street some really heinous things, I might be pretty effective at offending you. But if I try to then ask for forgiveness and reconcile with you from that same distance, it just won't work. That requires being up close. That requires seeing the sincerity in someone's eyes. It's so easy to offend from distance, but it's not possible to reconcile from distance. And I think the result is that that gap between offense and forgiveness is widening and widening. And the wider that gap gets, the more hurt there is in society. And then the more anger there is in society, the more loneliness there is in society, the more anxiety there is, the more suicidal tendencies there are. All of those mental health categories that we're seeing on the rise can oftentimes be traced back to the fact that we are a society that has come to offend one another very regularly, but actually the forgiveness and the reconciliation that is possible is far, far less. Now, okay, I've painted a pretty bleak picture to this point of contemporary culture. But one of the things I love about Jesus is that whether it was with people or with culture, he often looked for the good and the right before he just focused on the bad and the wrong. Okay, that's that's a whole other 
talk that I could give, but it's easy to see the negative and the frustrating things, whether it's in a person or whether it's in culture, it's often harder to find the good and what's right. But I think that's the approach that Jesus took. And I think it's worth it. So let me take a step back and summarize what culture is saying in these respects, and then ask whether we can find some good in it. So here are two things that I think culture is saying. Culture is saying we are more offensive than we think. And then culture is saying that apart from God, which is the assumption of a secular culture, apart from God, forgiveness is not possible. We are offenders and nothing we can do can bridge the gap to forgiveness. That's one way of articulating some of what culture is saying in these respects. And that's halfway to the gospel. There's a lot of good there that I can affirm despite the reality of my frustrations. We are more offensive than we think. That's gospel truth. All of us have sinned and fallen short. Not one is righteous, not even one. And apart from God, forgiveness is not possible. That's absolutely right. I think just recently uh, of the protests for racial justice, one of the images which is imprinted in my mind is someone holding, holding up a poster, no justice, no peace. It's the gospel in four words. If you only had four words to communicate the gospel, that's a pretty good attempt. Peace is only possible when justice is served. And the gospel claims that peace is possible because justice was served. When I first realized this, when I first had my, my view sort of reorientated toward culture, and I didn't give up my frustrations, I still see the frustrations, but I also see some of what's good and right and true in what's being communicated through culture. It, it brought conviction to me as well. It brought conviction about how oftentimes I treat individuals and culture very differently. When it comes to individuals, I look for the good, right? I know that individuals are sinful. I know that they're broken. I know that we're in ruin. I'm aware of all that. But when I meet a person, I'm thinking to myself, what's true in what they're saying? What's true? How can I pick up a remnant of truth in what they're saying and build a bridge to the gospel. Right? I'm taking Genesis 1 very seriously, that they were created in the image of God. This person is in the image of God, and so a remnant of truth and goodness remains. I'm taking Romans 1 very seriously. This person knows God somewhere deep down. Maybe that knowledge is suppressed, but they actually do know God in some way deep down because God has been revealing himself and he's been doing so plainly. I take those things seriously and I say, let me find the good. Let me find what's true and let me build a bridge to the gospel. But with culture, I often take a very different approach. Okay, with culture, I try to destroy any bridge so often. I go to war against culture. I want to counter culture. I want to make sure that there is no bridge so that nobody from that secular culture can get over to my side and corrupt me and my thinking and my family and my community and my business. Oftentimes I have very different approaches to people, individuals, and then to culture at large. But of course, culture in the most basic sense, in the most fundamental sense, is just people in community. And oftentimes it is very hard to love someone very well while being unqualifiedly negative about their culture. So I think that there are some remnants, remnants of truth in our culture that we can use to build a bridge to the gospel. Our culture affirms offense. That's a word that's in the vicinity of the concept of sin. Our culture also affirms the need for judgment. I actually find it very convicting that these two themes that culture is affirming are 
actually two of the themes that the church is in danger of compromising on. We're in danger of not seeing the severity of sin and refusing to talk about that because people don't find it comfortable. We're in danger of not affirming the justice of God in addition to his love and the need for judgment. And we're in danger of moving in the direction of a universalism where we don't take seriously the justice and the judgment of God. I find that very convicting that, that maybe God is even reminding us as the church of two important concepts in terms of our doctrine through the remnants of what culture is claiming and the particular points that we're in danger of compromising. Culture affirms offense and it affirms judgment. But what's missing, of course, is forgiveness and reconciliation. It's missing that forgiveness is possible. Maybe not without God. Maybe culture is right about that. Maybe not humanly, but divinely. Our culture can't conceive of a way for forgiveness to be offered without justice being trampled. But what if justice has already been served? For true reconciliation to be possible, justice must be satisfied and forgiveness must be offered. Both those two things, justice must be satisfied and forgiveness must be offered. Where do both of those occur? Where do they intersect? At the cross of Christ. Last year, one of my uh, best friends, he wound up in a, in a very bad uh, place. He woke up one morning with this feeling of impending doom in his stomach. And the feeling just never went away. He's not someone who had dealt with mental health challenges in the past. There wasn't one thing that happened that you could point to and say, oh, this is what happened. This is what he just woke up with this feeling of impending doom and it never went away. We got on the phone together with someone I know who's a mental health expert. I said to her, I said, how does this happen? And she said, sometimes anxiety works like this. She said, it can be like water pressure behind the dam and it builds. As life goes on, you take on more and more responsibilities. So often you take on responsibilities without letting other responsibilities go. And so they just build and they build and they build. She said, and here's the scary thing and the thing that people don't realize. She says, when the water pressure behind that dam is only one pound less than the dam can take, everything looks completely normal. Everything on the other side of that dam looks perfectly fine. And then when the water pressure is just one pound more than the dam can take, it bursts and you have utter catastrophe. Okay, many people are experiencing this. Many people are experiencing this now in the context of the pandemic. Statistics show something like 30% of people will have an anxiety disorder at some point in their lives, basically one in three. My friend did some intensive counseling over a period of a week, five days. I was invited uh, up to be part of that as part of his care team for his ongoing support. On the first day, uh, it was revealed that 12 years prior, my friend had done something wrong. Okay? He had hurt his spouse, his wife, in, in a certain way. And, and they knew it, but they hadn't dealt with it. And it just festered, right? They bought into that myth that time heals all wounds, but it didn't. It bought into that myth that I'll just make it up to her. I'll just, I'll just do enough until I'm blue in the face and then I'll, I'll balance the scales. And, and that's the way we'll have reconciliation. It doesn't work. For the first time, this, this Christian counselor explained to my friend the way reconciliation actually does happen. And he explained to him what it looks like to genuinely repent of something, to acknowledge that it was wrong, to acknowledge that it hurt someone, to express the emotion of your pain, that it pained someone else, and then to vulnerably sit before someone and to say, will you 
forgive me. Not just I'm sorry, which is still just a statement and doesn't give up control, but to actually ask a question, will you forgive me? And then to have to sit vulnerably because you are dependent on the other person to extend forgiveness in your direction. And probably for the first time in his life, my friend understood that. And he said that he wanted to do that. And he did. He, he repented to his wife with us watching. And then he asked those words, will you forgive me? And you could see like he was carrying a hundred pounds of weight on his shoulders. And then there was this pause and he just waited vulnerably. And then after a few seconds, she said, yes, I will. And I wish that every person on this planet could have seen the next scene. I mean, you could visibly see this weight just fall off of them. And they both instinctively lunged towards each other and they embraced. We we're about to move on in the counseling session. And my friend's wife jumped in and she said, can I, can I ask for forgiveness for something? We, we said, of course you can. She went through the same process and then she looked her husband in the eyes and said, will you forgive me? And there was that pause. And then he said that he would. And that same relief of burden and the lunging towards each other. Again, we were about to move on to the next session in the counseling. And then my friend turned to me and he said, is this what you mean when you talk about reconciliation with God? I had spoken to this friend for years, for decades now about the Christian faith, someone I grew up with. As soon as I came to Christ, I was trying to share Christ with him. I mean, I voluntold him that he was coming to the first Bible study that I ever put on, and I used every guilt trip I had in my bag to make sure he was there every Sunday for a Bible study. I had communicated the gospel and the faith to him, but it never really clicked. He never really understood it until he actually saw it. And maybe there's something here in the incarnation, right? God knew that for us to really understand the gospel, we were going to actually have to see it in the flesh. And here he saw in the flesh concretely, tangibly, what it meant to ask forgiveness from someone and then to receive that and for the relationship to be reconciled and the joy and the fruits of the spirit that bubble up from within when that occurs. It was such a powerful moment. And we said, yes, that's exactly what I've been talking about all these years. It made sense to him now because he had experienced the gravity of offense. He had experienced the, the seeming impossibility of forgiveness. And now he had seen Jesus break in and offer that forgiveness. And when he did, he understood the gospel for the first time. And he said that uh, he wanted to ask forgiveness from God. The counselor explained to him how he might do that and said to him, you know, you could do that on your own. That could be a private thing that you do. You could do that later, uh, you know, before you go to bed. He said, no, I'd like to do that right now. And right there in front of us, he went through that same process and he repented and he acknowledged and he asked for forgiveness. And then he had that deep sense within of God responding and saying that he is forgiven. <sighs> Let me make my way back onto our main pathway here of working relationships and relationships that work. Here's the point that I want to begin to land on. What an opportunity we have in a culture characterized by offensiveness and a lack of forgiveness to put forgiveness and reconciliation, the very core of the gospel, right at the center of our work life, right at the center of where many people spend most of their waking hours. The first conversation I have with everyone that I work closely with in a work context is this one. I sit down with the person and I say, I'm going to wrong you. That's not my intent. That's not my desire. 
But the reality of my sinful nature is that I'm going to wrong you. And if we work together closely and we work together regularly, I'm probably going to wrong you quite frequently. When I do, I would be so grateful if you would come to me about it. Rather than going to others first, if you would come to me directly about it. And my promise to you is that when you come to me directly about that, I'm not going to get defensive about it. I know I'm a sinner. (laughs) I'm not going to get defensive about it. I'm not going to try and argue you out of your perspective. In fact, I'm going to praise you for having the courage of coming to me and saying, this frustrated me. Can we talk about it? And it's very likely that that conversation is going to end with me asking for your forgiveness. Likewise, if I have frustrated you, and in the return, you have frustrated me at some point, my promise to you is that I will come to you about it. I'm not going to go to others about it. I'm going to come to you about it directly. You're going to know about it before other people know about it. uh, And we're going to talk through that. And I said, look, it takes a lot of the insecurity out of the workplace if we both make this promise to each other. Because if you know that I'm going to come to you and I know that you're going to come to me and we trust each other in that, then if you haven't come to me and I haven't come to you, then we know that we're good. But when that does need to happen, we work through it and we work towards reconciliation. I've had some very senior leaders um, in both ministry and in business tell me that that's idealistic, uh, but it's not realistic. And I have to disagree with that. I agree that if you say that once, uh, are people going to come to you? Maybe not. But if you say it with regularity, if you say it in a way that convinces people this is a core value for you, and if when people do actually come to you, you don't respond defensively, but you do seek forgiveness, this can become a central part of what it is to work together. And so here's a critical question for all of us on this call that I hope we will take seriously. When is the last time that you asked forgiveness from someone that you work with? When is the last time that you asked for forgiveness from someone who works under you on the org chart? When is the last time that you asked for forgiveness from your assistant? I find these questions really challenging because if I go a month and I can't think of an answer to those questions, one thing I can tell you for sure, it's not because I have had a perfect month right? It's because I'm letting that pride build up in me and I'm not willing to humble myself and put forgiveness and reconciliation at the center of my work life, which is such a significant part of how I spend my time. What I'm finding personally is that as you grow in leadership and you gain more responsibility, more of the decisions that you make impact other people and the decisions that you make impact more people, a greater number of people. And the result of that is that as you grow in leadership, it is very likely that you are going to sin against people more and you will sin against more people. And I think that means that as you grow in leadership, you should actually be increasingly asking for forgiveness from the people that you work with, from your coworkers, are we? Unfortunately, I think the reverse is often true. You know, the higher you get on the pecking order, the fewer people there are above you keeping you accountable. So you're not really kept accountable to having to ask for forgiveness or admit that you're wrong when you're wrong. Uh, And so we tend not to unless we absolutely have to. My recommendation would be to just err in the opposite direction. In the gray cases, err on the side of asking for forgiveness. Think of how many times you wronged someone and you didn't get found out. (laughs) you know, we never got frustrated about the fact that that happened. So if there's a few times where maybe I asked for forgiveness and it's not totally clear that it was me that was in the wrong, you know what, there are far more times when I was in the wrong and nobody found out. So I, I like to err on the side of asking for forgiveness and modeling the gospel in that way whenever I have the opportunity, uh, because I think it communicates core truth about what I believe And I think it keeps me honest about uh, myself as well. As Christians, if we want the gospel to be at the center of our working relationships, then it needs to be clear to our colleagues that we are just as much, you and me, we are just as much in need of a savior at work as we are on Sunday at church. 
Is the way that I conduct myself at work, is it communicating that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness? Or is it communicating that I am so perfectly competent at my job that it is very rare, if ever, that I get anything wrong and would need to reach out to someone to ask for forgiveness? I think how often you say the words, will you forgive me, is oftentimes a pretty good gauge at the answer to those, to those questions, whether we are operating with that deep understanding and communication of our need for a Savior at work and not just when we're worshiping on Sunday. Most people, I think, I think this is probably true, that most people go their entire lives without ever experiencing the power of forgiveness and reconciliation that is right at the heart of the gospel message in the way that my friend did. We have a radically countercultural opportunity to offer the gospel to our colleagues, maybe even to our clients and our customers at times, in a very concrete way. So often we think, how often have I communicated the gospel to someone that I work with? And we're thinking, how often have I laid out the key doctrines of the Christian faith? Important. Don't get me wrong. I spend my life doing it. <laughs> but just as important is, has, has someone that I work with actually experienced the gospel in the way that my friend experienced the gospel in that extending of forgiveness and reconciliation? And if we we're doing that regularly in the context of the workplace, actually living out the gospel as ambassadors who have been given a ministry of reconciliation by Jesus, then would it be the case? Like on that day in the intensive counseling that somebody will turn to us and say, is that what you mean when you talk about reconciliation with God? And then we can say, that's exactly what I mean. And it will make sense to someone and they will understand it because they've actually experienced it. The New York Times says that work is a dispiriting experience in that article I quoted to you at the beginning. Interesting choice of term. The Bible says the exact opposite. In the Old Testament, it's the same Hebrew word, avodah, the same word for both work and worship. That's the opposite of a work-life balance. That's a work-life continuity because all of our work is supposed to be a gift from God and intended as worship. And when you think about it, the first depiction of God in the Bible is as a worker. He worked for six days and then he rested on the seventh. God worked when he didn't have any kids to put through school. He didn't have a mortgage payment, right? He wasn't in need of anything and he chose to work. And that means that work is inherently good because God is a worker. And then the first depiction of humankind in the Bible also as workers before the fall, before there was evangelistic ministry to do, before the fall, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. Why? It says in Genesis 2 to work it and take care of it. And then the first depiction of Jesus as an adult, also as a worker, probably worked as a craftsman or a builder for probably about 18 years before his public ministry. Maybe he was the CEO of a, of a small business. Maybe his father wasn't around anymore. How did Jesus choose to spend his years on earth? He spent about 18 years in the secular workforce, and then he spent three years in unpaid ministry. Okay, that tells us a lot about the value that God places on work in a secular context, and it should really encourage us to resist any form of sacred secular divide. God created work, he created it as worship. Therefore, as workplace leaders, we're also called to be worship leaders. And therefore, mere working relationships, I don't think will do. We want the gospel to be right at the center of our relationships. And right at the center of the gospel is forgiveness and reconciliation. We need to bring to work our understanding of who we actually are, our identity that we know on Sunday, we need to know it through the whole week that we are a sinner in need of forgiveness. Therefore, if you're working with me, I'm going to wrong you. I can be upfront about that because that's the reality of who I am. But there's good news. Forgiveness and reconciliation is possible, even though our culture may tell us otherwise. And you know what? We're going to experience that in the context of our workplace because I'm going to encourage you when I wrong you to come to me and then I'm not going to get defensive 
and I'm going to ask you for your forgiveness. And that's going to be a powerful moment. That's what I hope we can bring to the context of work. When is the last time you asked for a colleague's forgiveness? If we want the people that we work with to ask for God's forgiveness, then what better way to start than to ask them for forgiveness? Model the gospel, model the repentance that leads to flourishing relationship. And then I think it will begin to make sense to people, this relationship between work and worship. As we experience in the context of the workplace, the reconciliation and the flourishing relationship that comes from it, that actually leads us to worship the one who makes that possible. So that is my uh, commendation to you uh, in the context in which you're working. We're living in an age where the culture is asking us, is, is making us ask questions with an earnestness we haven't in a long time. We are seeing truths being portrayed in culture about our offensiveness, but also the unforgiveness of culture because we don't think forgiveness is possible because we don't think that justice can be served. We have a beautiful message to share into our context that forgiveness is possible and peace is possible because justice has been served, but people won't hear that message unless they experience it in the flesh. And when you are spending more than half of your waking hours with people in the context of the workplace, and you're working on things you care about, and you're working with intensity, and you're working with under pressure, it is a context in which you are going to wrong each other. And what an opportunity that presents for us to actually give people the experience of the gospel through forgiveness and reconciliation. And then hopefully people turn and say, is this what you've been talking to me about for all these years. And we can say it is exactly what I've been talking with you about. And let me tell you more. Thanks so much for giving me a listen this evening. Uh, I'm most excited to hear your questions and what I can learn from you. So I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Vince. That was inspiring and fabulous. I think um, I probably speak for everyone that I definitely came away with some new ideas to use in my work life. Um, so for the folks in our audience, Vince has invited us to um, turn people on to camera to ask questions. And so we're going to experiment with doing that. Um, I do have a question already from Carrie Brown. So I'm going to turn Carrie on and um, allow a question there. Um, and this should allow, Carrie, it, this should allow you to turn your camera on. Why don't you try to do that? Um, and I encourage other folks, if you would like to ask questions, please put the questions in the question and answer. Um, and if you would like the possibility of being on I camera. Am. Are you there, Carrie? Uh, I am here and looking to look for the... So you can hear me, but you can't I see can me. I can hear you. So your camera button is that stop video button, I believe, on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Right. And I, I've actually done this quite a few times. I'm a uh, traffic hearing officer in Florida and do Zoom hearings. And oh. it's, I, I don't see that. Uh, I see the mute button. I don't see the... Um, video button. So. Well, and this is an experiment for us also. So why don't you go ahead and ask at least on um, verbally so you can at least ask Vince. There we go. Ah, here we are. There we go. It was, it was up by the uh, screen, not by the lower uh, icon. So here we okay. are. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Vitale. You've already answered my question. My question was um, transitioning from uh, a law practice to reviving a nonprofit in a very uh, contentious arena, the global warming arena, trying to be in the middle ground, which is a good place for a Christian to be, to try to bring two disparate uh, sides, disparate sides. So my question is, I've asked for money before, both in my work life and for secular fundraising and for spiritual fundraising, but now I'm going to be approaching friends and Princetonians, I'm Princeton class of 74, to give money to a cause to me, which is basically more to me so I can pay for the webmaster for the travel expenses. So it's a little less what I'm asking for myself. It's a little more uh, anxiety producing as you would say. But from your comments, I've already know how I'm going to address it. First is humility. 
I'm not an expert in climate. I'm more an expert, well, I'm not an expert in anything. That's what it'd be as a lawyer. We know a little about a lot of things as a lawyer. Uh, but humility that I've read a lot in the area, humility first, then ask for feedback. Here's the mission statement for the nonprofit, Spark of Freedom, Inc. And then lastly, if I have hurt your feelings because you have strong feelings against our mission, which is you do believe that draconian measures are needed for CO2 reduction, I ask for your forgiveness. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Um, so I think humility, feedback, and forgiveness. But if you can expand on that, I'd appreciate it. Asking money uh, from friends, asking money from friends is tough. Absolutely. You know, I mean, in the context of the ministry that I work with, uh, you know, the line between um, supporters and colleagues and friends and even family, you know, the godparents to my mm -hmm. children are are people that I work with as well. So I, I understand that complexity of having, you know, really no lines between those things. But, you know, I, 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 I take some uh, confidence in that, even in, in thinking that Jesus calls us friends, you know, and so even there, there's, there's a, a, a blurring together of different categories, right? We, we, there's clearly an authority structure there, right? We, we are asked to be obedient to and follow Jesus, um, and yet he also says, uh, I call you not servants, but friends. And so uh, I, I think that it's harder to mix these categories sometimes. But I think that when you do and you do it with humility, it is possible. And it can be particularly beautiful when you do, because it can bring a real holistic uh, friendship uh, to fruition where you're engaged in all these different levels of who you are. You're sharing more of who you are with someone and hopefully they're sharing more of who they are with you as well. So, you know, I commend you for being willing to step into this and also wanting to do it in the right way. Uh, you've already answered your question so well. Uh, the only thing I would add is um, the word invitation uh, is very important to me. Um, and it's an interesting concept. Uh, I'm often, you know, inviting people to say yes to Jesus, inviting people to say yes to the gospel in the context of, of an evangelistic setting. Um, I've often felt that there's a real uh, close relationship between my work and the work of our development team, um, because they, 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 they believe in what we're doing strongly and they're, and they're making an invitation to people to, to be involved in something that they believe is good and true and worthwhile. Uh, and, and oftentimes I see the way they make that invitation and I oftentimes learn something about how I make the invitation in terms of inviting people to the gospel. The thing about an invitation is that it should be a gift even if someone doesn't feel they're ready to say yes. If I invite you to my wedding, even if for whatever reason you need to RSVP no, you should feel honored that you were invited. Mm -hmm. And so that's the framework through which I think about this, whether I'm making an invitation in an evangelistic setting, whether I'm making an invitation in a development um, setting, I want to make it in such a way that the person would actually feel honored that I would think about them as being somebody who could get behind this sort of important endeavor in the right sort of way and with the right sort of integrity, because those are the sorts of people that I want supporting and praying for what is going to be done. And whether someone thinks it's the right time for them or not, they walk away and they go, huh, hmm. I'm honored that he asked. Uh, and it's a good thing to ask when we ask in the right way like that. Uh, and then going back to the evangelistic context, I always remember one student on a campus who came to faith. We were at the campus for a week, uh, about halfway through the week, she came to faith. It didn't seem like there was like some specific intellectual hurdle that she needed to get over. So I remember one of, uh, one of my colleagues asked her and said, well, why didn't you become a Christian sooner? And she really took the question seriously. She sort of leant back in her chair and thought about it. And then she said, I think I just needed an invitation. invitation. Yeah, uh, and that line has always stuck with me. And I've always thought to myself, boy, how many people do I walk by every day who just need an invitation? I always assume, you know, they're this far from Christ. They have that big impediment. But the reality is that no matter how big a party you're throwing and no, how, no matter how excited you are about the party and no matter how much you're looking forward to it, if you don't actually extend an invitation to the party to someone else, it's very unlikely that they're just going to show up. 
and God is throwing a huge banquet and we don't just want people to know about it. We want them to actually be there rejoicing with us. And so I always feel very good about extending that invitation as long as it is extended in a respectful way that makes someone feel honored to have received it, even if they're not ready to say yes. Very good, thank you, excellent. Thanks, Carrie. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Vince. Um, our next question is from someone who would um, like to be anonymous. So I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Um, so that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, I'd be curious to hear what areas of the culture you think are headed in a positive direction or is it all relatively doom and gloom? Um, I recognize that any non-Christian culture is inherently sinful but are there things in the broader culture that we can actually leverage or build upon? E.g. those who believe that the social justice movements can sit within a Christian worldview and be an entryway point for evangelistic conversations with others. Yeah, thank you so much for, for this question. I, I really appreciate it. And I think you're hitting on, you know, just what is kind of dear to my heart at the moment. Um, and also convicting in my heart that I can often find it so much easier to go first to the criticism of culture and only kind of secondarily work my way back to where there might be positives. But actually, it's the positive things, it's the viable things in something which is ruined that you can still use to build a bridge. And so really, my ordering should be the other way around. And I appreciate that uh, encouragement from you. And I think about Jesus talking to the woman at the well in John 4, right? and, and she's doing everything she can to highlight the differences in culture between her as a Samaritan and Jesus as a Jew, and, and, to, and, to, and to highlight the fact that she believes one thing and he believes another, and they are contentious and they're at odds, and so one must be right and one must be wrong, and Jesus is doing everything he can. It's an amazing passage to read through from this lens of what we're talking about, and every time Jesus resists the temptation to criticize her or her viewpoint or her culture, and he tries to find something to build a bridge with, you know, so she says, but wait, we, you know, we, we can't be having this conversation, right? You, you, you Jews believe we need to worship at this temple, but we believe Samaritans that we need to worship on this mountain. And it would have been so easy for Jesus to give her, well, actually, <laughs> actually, you know, in my infinite wisdom, here's the correct answer to that question. Instead, he says, well, okay, yeah, there's, there, there's a remnant of truth in what you're saying, because you know what, one day we're going to worship neither in that temple nor on that mountain, but we're going to worship in spirit and truth, right? And I, I love that, right? He could have so easily just jumped into the disagreement, but instead he looked for something positive from which he could build a bridge. And as I transitioned later in my talk, that's what I was hoping that, that I was doing, you know, to say, you know what, our culture is saying that we're more offensive than we think. Now, sometimes that frustrates me. Sometimes aspects of our victimhood culture frustrate me. But you know what, there's a lot of things that were kind of seen as not that bad, or just boys being boys, or whatever it is, even when I was a kid that now as a culture we've recognized as actually deeply wrong and deeply hurtful of people. And I'm really thankful for that. And so it makes me think as a Christian, okay, yeah, I have my frustrations with culture in that respect at times, but do I really want to spend most of my time and energy saying how wrong culture is in that respect, rather than looking to what's right and what's good and taking a step back and saying, look, culture is saying that we're more offensive than we think we are. Well, I've been trying to say that for decades, ever since my conversion, I've been trying to convince all my friends and my family of that, that we are sinners in need of a savior, that there is this gap between us and forgiveness that needs to be bridged. If that's something that culture is getting at, at least in a partial way through a remnant of truth and what's being said, let me focus there uh, first. So there's so much that, that we can take as starting points you know, to culture, whether it's uh, pieces of artwork, or, um, or, 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 or pieces of writing. Um, you know, we just heard from Kerry what he's doing in terms of global warming uh, and environmental justice. Now there's a contentious issue. There's one where we could just jump 
to all our criticisms and all our disagreements. But when I have a student come up to me on a college campus, very passionate on that topic, whichever direction they're coming from, the first thing I wanna do is affirm and say, I really appreciate your passion for an issue of justice. I really appreciate the way you see that some things are right and some things are wrong in an objective sense that really matters for the lives of individuals and for what we should be devoting our time to. Where does that passion come from for you? And where does that sense of right and wrong and the need for justice come from for you? And now let me share something about where that comes from from my perspective as well. And again, so easy for us to jump into a disagreement when actually oftentimes staring us in the faith is the perfect starting point to build a bridge to a meaningful conversation and then a gospel conversation and then the person of Jesus. So really appreciate your encouragement uh, on this. And I, I completely agree. Thanks, Vince. I think, unfortunately, we just have time for one more question. So um, I'm going to invite Chris Hunt um, to pop on and ask a question. Chris, you should now be able to unmute yourself and turn your video on. Are you seeing how to do that? Let's see. It's a little dark. Can you hear me? We can hear you and see you. Thank you so Got much. It. You might be able to barely see me. I'm, I'm in the car with my nine-year-old son in Northwest Arkansas, so I appreciate you bearing with me, but excellent talk. Thank you so much, Vince. My question has to do with the nature of virtual relationships and workplace gospel ministry in a 100% virtual context. And I've been 100% remote. I work in marketing for a Fortune 500 consumer goods company and have been remote for the past year and a half. So I've been grappling with this question even pre-COVID, but now it just seems... <laughs> It just seems like there's an extra barrier to having these difficult, vulnerable conversations of asking for forgiveness when you're not there to build relationships in the same context that you were before. I, I welcome any thoughts you have, again, with regard to workplace ministry in a 100% virtual context. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for that question. And yeah, what a time we're in. Uh, it seems like there's such an opportunity to be talking about these things and to be taking steps towards forgiveness and reconciliation, partly because people are reflecting more on the deep questions of life and the questions of meaning. And we have the Google search for God hitting that five year, year high. And, and I see it. And when, even when we're doing digital events in terms of the emotion that rises to the surface when people ask their questions and yet we can't get face to face with anyone. So, so we have, we have the, uh, this opportunity that's kind of staring us in the face and yet we can't actually get face to face with someone, which I do believe is the ideal way. Uh, to be able to uh, to engage with someone, especially when we're talking, doing so in a vulnerable way. Uh, so I do think it's I do think it's very difficult, and I don't think there's kind of an easy kind of we couldn't do this, so now do this, and it'll be just as good. Uh, but I do think that if we can create space for people to be able to share their experience, in particular of this season, you know, as ministry, we've gone through some difficult things uh, recently. Um, both with uh, the death of our founder, also with the pandemic that we're going through now. You know, what, what we do is we have a, a time every morning where we gather um, for prayer. We then have on Wednesday, we have more of a chapel service. But now in the context of kind of ministry, you know, and this might be something which could translate more even to, you know, the realm of kind of a secular context. One of the features that we've really used even on, on Zoom here um, is the breakout rooms. Uh, and we found that it's very different being in a room with three or four others on Zoom than it is being in a, a big event with a hundred or, or a thousand. So we have used that type of event where actually the portion of, of the gathering where we're speaking to the large group is actually very short and is often left with a question for people to consider. And then we break out into the small groups and ask people to reflect on that question together. And I've been really pleasantly surprised with how vulnerable people are willing to be uh, in that context. I think it's partly what we're actually going through and us all having this common experience of going through the pandemic together, whereas so often our experiences of grief are so different from one another because we're going through such different things. There's a commonality 
that we can that we can find in what we're going through. And I find that if it can be in that smaller group rather than in the larger group, uh, people are often really willing to really willing to engage. So that's something that that I would recommend seeing if you can do that in kind of a small group context, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, the the model for this, I believe, as we try to lead in those sorts of contexts, is a, a willingness to be vulnerable. Uh, and a willingness to serve, you know, that's what's going to create the trust that allows people to open up and be willing to kind of journey together. You know, we've been talking about workplace ministry, working life, leadership uh, tonight. Another thing that Jesus says, which has always meant, you know, a lot to me is that we who want to be first need to be last and the servant of all. Uh, and that word all has always been very convicting of, to me in the context of the workplace in particular. So not just the servant of those who are good for what I do or who can get me to a certain place in the workplace context, but the servant of the person that I find I have the most friction with, the servant of the person who is least, the person who is furthest down on uh, the org chart. What does it look like to serve that person in particular and then that vulnerability when we do get into those small groups you know either myself or sometimes i'll tap one of my colleagues on the shoulder and say hey can you share first because i know they'll be willing to share vulnerably and oftentimes if somebody sees somebody go first and be willing to share vulnerably even in that digital context uh, people are willing to share and again there we just go back to the model of jesus who could have communicated truth to us in any form, I always find that amazing to think, you know, Jesus is the God of the universe, and he could have chosen to communicate truth to us by writing it in the sky, by fireworks, by, by anything that he chose. And he chose to communicate truth to us through the most vulnerable means possible, by making himself as vulnerable and weak as possible before people and making himself the servant of all. And it was in that context that not only truth was communicated, but love was communicated and people could respond to him in a relational way. So I think if we get people into the small groups, if we invite that sort of vulnerability, but most of all, if we're willing to lead with that sort of vulnerability as we follow the one who was most vulnerable, then hopefully we'll see a real impact. Thank you so much. Vince, thank you so much. I um, feel bad about this, but I think we are unfortunately going to need to call it an evening. Um, I want to say, first of all, thank you to all of our Cornerstone partners again and remind folks that I'm just putting the link in our, um, in our chat again, that if you'd like to jump on board and support the ministry, including events like this that we're able to host, I encourage you to do so. Um, and then I also like it to turn it over to Karen to um, end us for the evening. But thank you again, Vince. Thank you, Christine. Vince, thank you so much. I know we have all been incredibly challenged and inspired tonight. Thank you for your insight and your wisdom. We're so grateful for the time that you've spent with us tonight. And thank you to our guests. We still have several excellent questions in the hopper. I'm sorry we don't have four hours of Q&A with Dr. Vince Vitale. Um, there's so much for us to learn. But thank you all so much for taking your evening to join us and to hear from Vince. Um, and I just want to close us out in prayer and bless uh, Vince for his time with us. Lord Jesus, thank you um, that you are God, you are such a relational God. You have come after us through Jesus, the son, and even sending your spirit to come after us. And we thank you for this incredible testimony of Vince's life and how you have done this in his life, how you have taught him these sacred lessons of wisdom and humility, forgiveness and sacrifice. And so, Lord, we ask you now um, that you would take these lessons and that you would bear fruit in our own lives, our own work relationships, in our own family relationships, as even one of these coming questions was alluding to. Um, God, use it. Use these things to bring lasting and noticeable change for having spent time together in your presence tonight. Um, bring the change that we long for and that you long for. So Lord, we bless Vince and his family and his ministry in the name of Jesus. 
And I bless all of these guests in the name of Jesus. Have your way in our lives, Lord. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you again, Vince. Thank you, guests. God bless you. And we'll see you again soon. Good night. Good night. Thank you.